Hi guys, it's Rob Flux here from Property Developer Network and I'm here once again for another Sunday session. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about sales strategies that uh, that sell, sorry a bit of a tongue twister on a Saturday, she sells seashells by the seashore. So let me say that again, sales strategies that sell. Uh, so this is an alternative way for actually selling your property uh, where you can actually do that yourself and today's special guest we have David Cady from Revolutionary Real Estate. So David, how are you, mate? Excellent, Rob. Great to be with you. Thank and you. Thank you. To, um, Just uh, allow me to uh, stop the screen share and get to see your uh, your handsome face, my friend. <laughs> uh, That's an overstatement. <laughs> uh, David, you and I go back uh, quite some time. You've been a member of my property developer network for, I'm going to say, good six, maybe seven years. Would that be right? Yeah, it's about right, Rob. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I even remember you going back some time ago, even presenting a real deal uh, way back in the day. Uh, so you've been in and around this property space for quite some time, mate, and you've come up with, uh, I guess, an alternative way of selling, which is a little bit, uh, I won't say anti-agent, uh, but it's pro probably pulling the, the agent process apart, understanding that a little bit better, uh, and then giving that power back to the user uh, for them to use to see how they, how they see fit. Is that probably a good, fair way to, to say that, mate? That's pretty much it. And it's not just a different way. I would, I would say it a different way. I would call it a different way of thinking about uh, the way it's done because, um, you know, a for me, way of thinking of the way <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that, well, that, that's a tongue twister. Explain that, mate. Well, people talk about selling properties and, and selling this, selling that. Um, I, I believe that a property can't be sold. A property is never sold. Um, a property can only be made viable. And I think that's the distinction um, uh, between my approach and the traditional industry's approach. Okay. Um, do tell, mate. Do tell. Yeah, well, look, uh, um, you can decide to sell all you want, but without a buyer deciding to buy, you will never, ever have a transaction. And um, from trial and error and, um, you know, transacting on my own deals over the years, I found that there's a, there's a process um, that's responsible for making any property viable. And this process doesn't care who follows it, doesn't care how much you pay for it. Um, if it's followed right, it, it does the job each and every time. It could be the best agent. Um, it could be you. It could be you and I working together. doesn't matter. Excellent. And so uh, for our audience that's listening today, for them to actually understand that process, that then empowers them to then determine, well, do I want to A, sell it myself or B, uh, find the right agent that follows this process or, or a, I guess, a variation of that uh, or engage someone such as yourself who would, I guess, help them and assist them in that process. Is that correct? That's right. Exactly. Um, so people have several options. I mean, for, for many years, the only two options available to people were either to sell uh, via an agent or, or privately. And that was it. Um, and I obviously I would say this, but I think there's a, there's a better alternative. Um, and, and that's what I'm a big advocate of. So I, I'm, uh, I'm waiting for the secret sauce, mate, but we'll, uh, we'll leave that little teaser for a little bit later in the process, wait for a few more people to, uh, to come on board. But, uh, I guess that the, there'd be thousands of properties sold, uh, throughout Australia uh, every single day. But I guess when you look at, um, uh, I guess a, a whole year and about 98% of them, I think from memory, go through a, a, a real estate agent. Uh, so what's the, the what's your thinking behind that when you're trying to come up with an alternative approach? Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a couple of other alternatives with, you know, list it yourself type uh, agencies and the like, but mm -hmm. uh, why do so many people go through real estate agents? Oh, that's a very, very long, um, there's probably a, a lot of reasons for that, but um, well, like one of them, time, mate. <laughs> no, 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 look, and, and that's what pe people see, um, uh, the agent's faces and the signs and, and the sold stickers everywhere. So they automatically think that, well, that property was sold by that agent. Um, but people make the classic mistake of mixing um, or confusing causation with correlation. Um, just because an agent is involved in the transaction doesn't mean that they actually cause the sale. Um, and that's where a lot of people get mixed up and confused. And, you know, one of the other general uh, reasons is, you know, for generations and decades, this is just the way it's been done. 
you know, your parents did it that way, your grandparents did it that way, your friends and family have done it that way. They haven't died, so it can't be that bad. Yeah, and, and uh, I guess we're in the age of disruption. So we've got uh, the Ubers of the world and uh, and the like. Uh, and so your, your attempt is to try and disrupt the sales uh, industry. Uh, and I note that you've been, you know, quite successful in that approach, uh, looking at your website and the number of people who've bought property, uh, not not sold property, but uh, bought bought properties through your process. Uh, mm -hmm. Notice that you've been on Channel Nine and a number of other media sources, mate. So your name's definitely getting out there. Yeah, look, I think um, uh, this this way of thinking about uh, the transaction or what happens um, is getting more traction, and, and I think it, um, it should because people should look at it from a different angle, a different perspective, and to really understand what, what goes on, the real true dynamics of this transaction, um, you know, when a property is transacted. And I think not enough people know about this, despite the fact that property seems to be a, a national, you know, hobby pastime in Australia. <laughs> uh, well, I'm quite keen, and I'm sure our audience is quite keen to, to hear a little bit of an overview of the process. Uh, and how you actually break that down from a preparation mm. perspective. I've bought a lot of properties in my time and sold a lot of properties as well. So I'm quite keen to learn uh, where I can tweak myself, mate. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm going to admit to all the mistakes that I'm making in the process once you highlight it. But uh, it, it, is there a is it a 10 step plan, a five step plan? How, how's this actually broken down? Yes, it is a five-step plan, but obviously that, oh, that over <clears throat> random guess <laughs> that that over that oversimplifies things. It, it's just to um, um, and guess what? They all start with the same letter, a P. Um, so you know, just to make it that much catchier. But look, I um, <clears throat> I think it, before we get to those steps, um, you know, we've got to take another step back and um, and understand the reason why we're doing what we're doing. Um, there are only two reasons why anybody buys any property, awareness and perceived value. Um, no one buys a property they don't know exists. Um, so they have to find out about it somehow. Usually it's, it's marketing that does that, advertising. Um, that's the easy bit. Uh, perceived value is the more difficult um, component um, because it consists of, um, of several different you know, sub, sub components. Um, perception, obviously, each person values a property differently. They, they see different um, value in it. Um, the, the two questions people ask themselves is, what am I going to pay? Or what, what am I expected to pay? And what am I getting? Um, and so they keep constantly weighing those two up. Um, and the fourth component is, uh, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in context of, uh, of your competition. So people um, look at that in the context of, of what else is available. So, um, so the only goal of any marketing campaign, whether it's done by an agent or, um, or you or whatever way, um, is to achieve um, uh, perceived value in the mind of a um, potential buyer and ideally more than one to create competition. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess as a buyer of property, uh, I always try to uh, look at that perceived value uh, area in a number of different ways because I'm not the only person who might actually be looking to buy that property. So I look at it from the angle of what would uh, an emotional buyer as an owner occupier want to pay for that? I look at that as what would myself as a developer want to pay for that? I look at that as what would an investor want to pay for that? And I try and work out the different value propositions and the different valuation methods that each one of those uh, I guess different buying personas would want to actually take on, uh, and that I guess the uh, the higher value is the one that that tends to be the one that the price point is aimed at, uh, and I then try to take on that persona in no negotiating because if they're trying to aim it at my market, then I'm going to try and pretend to be that person when I go and buy it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, exactly right, and. And there's a lot of that involved as well, um, because there are properties out there uh, which do have a lot of potential uh, buyers. And again, the whole process starts with the buyer, you know, um, the end in mind. Who Who is the likely buyer for that property? So you've got to um, gear your strategy um, of creating perceived value to either one or more of these groups. Um, and ideally, that group who is um, likely to pay more than another. And, and I see many, many... Uh, real estate agents fall into this trap 
where they have an ad that tries to target two completely different market demographics. Uh -huh. uh, you know, they're trying to, to get the emotional buyer at the same time. Uh, it's, you know, and the ability to, to subdivide subject to council approval. Well, who are you actually aiming this at, right? Um, uh, and they don't, they seem to be having an each way bet. Um, yes. Whereas you're, you're saying very clearly, work out who your target market is, get, them, get that right. Uh, and then you can actually take that on. And uh, strangely, that that very message I've been saying for years, and I talk to my agents uh, who bring me properties, and, and we actually get them to bring it to us before it hits the market, and we can tell them which marketing strategy that they actually want to go down for that exact reason, so they can hit their market right. So, uh, mate, uh, so one out of one, mate, we're, we're both on the same page for that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> and look, to, to add to that, you know, within within a certain pool of buyers, you know, the emotional um, retail buyer, there could be several different groups. There could be, um, you know, first home buyers or, or downsizers. So there is always going to be some overlap, but that's okay. I mean, you can speak to both of those because they're subsets of, of the same buyer pool. Yeah, correct. Yep. Um, so what's your next step, my friend? Well, um, once you know who your ideal buyer or buyers um, are likely to be, um, then you need to, um, you know, try and communicate to them, um, raise their awareness and, um, and inject or create that perceived value uh, in their mind. And the way to do that is through this five-step process, which is um, preparation, presentation, pricing, promotion and parlaying. Um, now, parlaying is, um, uh, is not just a negotiation, it's every bit of communication that happens with prospective buyers from the first spoken word. Um, so it's much more than just negotiation. Negotiation actually, actually starts, I believe, um, with the first spoken word. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, for the sake of simplicity, because properties are very different, you know, there's development sites, there's, um, you know, the new retail product, um, there's the, the family home, which has been lived in for 10, 20 years. <clears throat> so, you know, let's say we're talking about the family home here um, that has been, you know, around for a few years. Um, the preparation uh, is basically geared towards um, uh, eliminating any potential buyer objections. So, you know, repairing, fixing obvious things that, that need to be um, uh, taken care of before uh, the property goes to market. Um, essentially, what you want to do is stop people asking the question, what else is wrong with this home? So, uh, and interesting because one of my negotiation tactics in buying properties is to go looking for those exact same flaws. Uh, and I don't look at it just in regards to the property in itself. I look at it in regards to the property, the surrounding area, uh, I guess, um, neighbours, all those sorts of things. And I look for all of those objections. So, uh, you know, there's been times where when I'm selling a property, um, I've spoken to my next door neighbour and said, hey, I'm mowing my lawn. Can I mow your nature strip and, and trim your hedge all at the same time? Would you mind? Uh, you know, for those exact same reasons. So, yeah. Um, what, are the, what are the common uh, issues that you see in that presentation side where, where people fall down all the time? Well, look, that still you mean with with the preparation side. That's still the yeah, first step, right? Preparation side. Um, yeah, look, I, I guess anything. Think of it as um, anything that would that a building and pest inspection would show. And and for that reason, I often recommend to people, um, especially those who have uh, homes that are more susceptible to to these issues, to get a building and pest report done um, before they go to market, because. Um, there's nothing worse than, you know, finding your ideal buyer who's fallen head over heels in love, um, reached deep in their pockets uh, to give you the money you want. Um, and then come the building and pest inspection, uh, all these issues come up and, you know, they've got this massive leverage to, to get your price down um, or pull out of the deal. There's nothing worse than that. So, uh, so my approach with that as a buyer uh, so quite often I'm buying properties that I'm going to be subdividing, carving up, and I, I will resell the existing house once we've done a, uh, a little bit of a reno to it in some instances. So I will actually get my building and pest guy to actually go in and do an initial report when I'm buying. And then I get the same building and pest inspector to come back a second time once I've fixed up all the, all the work. 
Uh, and for them, the second time around, it's much quicker because they're just going tick, tick, tick. Yes, that's all fixed. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I supply a, a finished building a pest um, uh, report. And I actually willingly hand that over to the other side and it takes away the objection and takes away a negotiation point for them to say subject to building and pest. You go, well, I've just given you a building and pest. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And even though many people won't um, won't necessarily take that, they will. They may still insist on their own. It's um, it, it's a wonderful tool, Rob, because you're, you're removing a lot of leverage away, um, and you're also um, injecting a lot of um, trust into the transaction because you're you're opening the kimono, and and saying, you know, here it is. Um, uh, I'm not holding anything back, um, and that builds trust. And I would have to say that one of the craziest things that I see is uh, where vendors go down the, the auction path and they don't provide that up front, right? So uh, every buyer coming in is going to need to do a building and pest. So why would you not spend that small amount of money to make that incoming uh, buyer, uh, I guess, like I said, very transparent and, and take away that expense and that unknown for them? Exactly. Absolutely. Yep. And look, even if you go, uh, even if you get a building and pest done um, before you go to market and it, and it shows that there's there's nothing, nothing major, nothing to be done. You haven't wasted the money. You've um, you can use that document to show buyers and, you know, exactly for this transparency and um, and, and to build trust. So it, it's not money wasted. No, very good. And, and uh, trust is a key uh, element to to this whole uh, process. And uh with your particular process, you're encouraging the homeowner to be the one that is actually the one selling as opposed to an agent. Uh, and I'm assuming that's based purely on that trust element. Uh, so tell me a little bit about how that works better when the owner is actually selling the home rather than the agent. Okay. Um, well, this is actually the secret sauce uh, that you mentioned before. And um, the owner is not selling because remember, a property cannot be sold. Um, so when I, when I say to people, you've got to open the door yourself, they say, well, what's some, am I going to have to sell the home? And I say, no, 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 you can't sell a home. It doesn't matter what you say. Um, you can't talk anyone into buying a home. Um, so the, the secret source is actually, um, the person living inside the home. Um, and most people are terrified of themselves, um, to, to, to do this. And that's why they, they outsource it to, to an agent, despite the fact that we all know that you cannot outsource vested interest. Yet when we engage an agent, that's exactly what we're doing. We're outsourcing vested interest. Now, why are you, the owner of the home, the secret source? Um, very simple. Um, that there are actually uh, several reasons for this. Um, when you're opening the door to your home and someone and, and a prospective buyer walks through, eventually they're gonna find out that you're not an agent. Um, and actually I had this, um, occur just yesterday with, um, with one of my most recent clients and, um, uh, the, the prospect was very surprised initially. Um, and then they dropped their guard. They, they completely dropped their guard and they just started divulging information, um, to this vendor that they would never, ever reveal to an agent. Um, because, you know, they perceive this equality. Um, you know, it was just a blood and flesh human being who opened the door. It wasn't a silver tongued, um, you know, cunning agent, um, who was going to say and do all sorts of things to, um, you know, get into their wallet. So, um, so that, that builds a lot of trust. Um, now if you, if you think about it, when you've got someone and it's usually an agent representing you, um, if it's done in the traditional way, uh, the prospective buyer never encounters you they never see you never meet you and because of that they don't care about you they don't know you they don't care about you and why should they and if they don't care about you um the nature of the transaction becomes a lot more adversarial there's a greater chance of them um you know giving you low ball offers or, or um or cheeky offers um or throwing obstacles at you know at you because they don't see the impact of that um of their action right there's no direct feedback um, it's filtered, but if, if there's more direct, um, interaction between the buyer and the seller, which most sellers are absolutely petrified of, um, yeah. then, you know, the, the way that, um, this changes the nature of the transaction, it becomes more collaborative, um, more win-win, um, and it lays fertile ground for fruitful negotiations. 
um, which again, a lot of vendors uh, are not confident about, and I don't recommend that they actually negotiate. That's another topic that um, we can cover. Um, but yeah, it, it lays the ground for for a smoother transaction, and there's a lot less fighting and and you know throwing hurdles at each other. Oh, that that's half the fun, mate. Is the, is the, that's half the fun, um, and. Uh, yeah, I, we'll get into the negotiation part of things a little bit later. I, I, there's plenty that I've learned in my time, both in buying and selling that uh, from a, you mentioned parlay before, um, that there's plenty of uh, tips and tricks and tactics that can go into that side of things to uh, uh, create a tussle. Uh, a tussle always has to be had. Um, whether you whether they've met your offer or not, if you don't give someone a tussle, they don't think that they've actually got the value. So, yes, absolutely yeah. right. <clears throat> exactly. There's uh, a whole art to that. Yeah, correct. So uh, so what was your next uh, P? The next P is, um, uh, is presentation. Now, this is crucial. I think this step does the heavy lifting um, and it's underestimated by most home sellers. Um, and this is where most of your time and money should be spent if you want to achieve the best results um, from your sale because it's presentation that is meant to engage um, the buyer emotionally. And it's the emotion provided you're selling a retail product um, because it is the emotion that will enable them to reach deeper into their pocket. Um, and the only way to to appeal to people's emotions is through their senses of sight, sound, smell, and touch. And the more of these senses you can appeal to, um, the more emotional uh, engagement you can create. And if you can't create that, then all your marketing is a commodity. And there's only one way to separate two commodities or tell the difference between them, and that's price. Um, but you've got to take the focus off price, and the way to do that is with presentation. Yep. And I guess that's assuming, of course, that you're... Uh, ultimate buyer is a is a, an emotional purchaser, uh, a home buyer, not an investor or developer. They're going to be very numbers driven um, typically. Uh, yes. But so, and that's hence the, the understanding what your market demographic is right up front. So it, exactly. Um, but yeah. I'll add to that that even mum and dad investors who are looking for um, an investment property will usually buy a property that they would live in themselves. They shouldn't, yeah, but they do. It's a it's a fatal flaw of the uh, of the naive uh, property investor is this would be a lovely place that I'd like to live. Therefore, it must be a great investment. Correct. Uh, unfortunately, exactly. as, as uh, special as we want to think we are, um, we think that we are we are unique, but everyone is unique just like us. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what's that Monty Python? Lion, you're all individuals. I'm not. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, okay, so presentation. So uh, we've had plenty of people talking uh, in our network for quite some time on, on different ways of presenting, so with styling and that sort of thing. But uh, are there other tips and tricks that you, that you talk about with regards to that? Absolutely. So, I mean, styling is great, but these days that's, it's almost expected. Um, and, and those who overlook it or think, um, oh, it's too much money, um, think, of it, think of it the wrong way. It, it's not an expense, it's an investment. It really is. And look, I don't suggest that you style every nook and cranny of, of a home. You don't need to do that. Um, you know, if you've got a four bedroom home, you don't need to style all four bedrooms. Um, the master bedroom and the main living areas um, are the critical spaces, um, external and internal living spaces. Um, that's where your focus should be, but it will give you a return on investment. Um, but that just um, appeals to the visual and, and tactile. Um, you've got to appeal to all senses, um, sight, sound, smell, and touch. So when a prospective buyer comes um, through the home, depending on the style and age of home, <clears throat> you, should, um, you should have music playing in the background. Um, you know, soft music, whether it's, you know, soft jazz or, or classical or whatever it may be, as long as it's not um, a, a very particular type of, of, of genre that will put a lot of people off. Um, so the rule is to offend the least uh, number of people <laughs> with whatever you're playing. <laughs> um, but, even if, but even if you don't like classical or jazz, you're not going to be offended by it. It'll create some mood um, in the home. So that's one thing. Um, smell. 
um, whether you're, it's you're baking diffu- bread and cook and cookies and stuff like that. Yeah. Absolutely. It will freshly brewed coffee. If you want to go to that extent, knock yourself out. It's it's not going to hurt. Absolutely. Um, and you know, if you're a little bit more lazy, uh, then you know, lemon scented diffusers. A lemon scent has been proven to um, to elicit you know, that kind of response in, in potential buyers. Um, so, you know, go with the science. Yep. Very good. Uh, so is that three P's down now? So what do we got? So we're at two. We so pre- preparation, presentation. Yep. Next uh, one is... Go on. Go for, it. go for it. No, no. Yeah, next one is pricing. Um, and my God, uh, I don't think this is as important in achieving a higher sell price as presentation, but it's just as crucial to the success of a campaign. And uh, um, most people don't realize that this actually consists of two components. Firstly, you need to establish a price range or a price zone within which uh, your property is likely to sell. Um, Now with some properties that's easier done than with others. you know, homes that look alike, you know, in a given suburb and there's, you know, millions of them, it's going to be a very narrow tight range, um, yep. especially for lower end homes, you know, um, anything below six, $800,000, anything above that, you're looking at wider price ranges. Um, but that's okay. Uh, as long as, as long as you establish some kind of a price range. Now there's a way of, of doing this. There's a, um, you know, scientific way of going about this. Um, and I don't know whether we've got time for that, but once you've established that, that's just the first step. The more important step, I believe, is how you communicate um, or pitch uh, the value to the market, because this is the second component of the perceived value, right? It's presentation and pricing. So this is this is crucial. And the way you pitch it must um, satisfy a number of criteria. Firstly, it's got to... Um, uh, it's got to be done in a way um, which uh, you know, which is not unre- not um, misleading uh, to people. Um, you, you've got you've got to communicate some kind of an indication, you know, for sale or buy negotiation or, or you know that's not good enough. I believe um, you know you're wasting the opportunity to create perceived value, um, but you've got to give that guide or, or guidance or indication in a way that doesn't paint you into a corner and allows for upward negotiation with, um, with your ideal buyer. Um, and you've got to do it in a way which means that you'll never have to reduce the way you pitch or the price to, um, throughout the campaign because that sends the wrong signal. So there's a number of things you've got to achieve with, with how you, how you, you know, communicate or pitch that price. And, and around price, I've always found that there are actually, uh, four price points to actually be aware of uh, when you're coming into the sales process. So one is the advertised price. Um, uh, one is the minimum price that the, the seller will actually sell the property for. Uh, so they should be aware of, I guess, where they are sitting in those two ranges. And then you've got the incoming person or, or people, and there'd be what would be the maximum price that, that uh, an individual might be prepared to pay. Um, Mm -hmm. So me and myself as a buyer and remembering your different market demographics as to what they might be prepared to do. Uh, And then if you're, if you're getting into a multi uh, vendor uh, offer situation, what's the highest price that the third party might be prepared to pay. So when it gets into contention. So uh, Mm -hmm. if you think about all of those, when you're going, uh, I guess, into that sales process, if you can think about the perceived value that the other people buying the property are going to come off you, mm. you can set your expectations right and set the, the price point right and, and hit the sweet spot. Absolutely. And one of the reasons why uh, I'm dead set against auctions is because um, uh, it doesn't allow for any outliers. Okay. Um, in a good campaign, um, you should have some competition. And that competition is going to create a number of offers, ideally. And those offers are going to come in at all sorts of, you know, within that range, all sorts of prices. <clears throat> now, the massaged final offer um, is likely to end up, again, in all sorts of different places. But with an auction, um, you want, you know exactly what your competition is bidding. Um, once their budget's exhausted, all you need to do is bid five grand more. Yeah, so, so my... Uh 
cynical view of an auction is that uh, it, it's the, the first bid above what the last guy was prepared to pay. Um, so it's, it's never, I guess, the most, uh, the most you can get for the property. There's always yeah. potentially some headroom. I'll, I'll say potentially. Um, Absolutely right. Yeah. And, and, and this is why auctions are a great place to buy. Fantastic places to buy. So the thing with an auction also is it takes away uh, a, a very specific element in the process. And that is that not all vendors are wanting uh, an unconditional uh, sale, get out of the house right now. Some of them need terms. Some of them need time to go buy the next place. Some of them need, uh, I guess, uh, you know, they might be after a higher price point. They might be flexible on their terms to actually allow that to occur. And an auction process takes that flexibility of offers away from them um, and, and the ability for them to actually reflect that perceived value uh, out to the market. Well, it removes those buyers altogether. And, yeah, and even though that those buyers may have been in a position to pay more, um, you know, with terms, um, you know, you've, you've lost them. That's it. They're gone. Yeah. Um, but the, the reason why auctions are so popular is because, you know, it's, it's the lazy, um, it's lazy agents way of marketing because the agent can say, see, this is what the market's saying. It's not me, it's the market. Yeah. So I can see a few questions coming through, but we, I, let's, let's finish off the, the five P's and then take a few questions from, uh, uh, from the, the audience. Uh, so uh, that's three P's down, mate, uh, two to go. Okay, next one. Uh, this is the easiest one, um, promotion. Um, it really is uh, how to create max, uh, maximum awareness uh, with your property. Um, and again, you're looking for um, biggest bang for buck here. So yes, you can promote everywhere. You can, you know, promote in newspapers, um, spend a ton of money doing that in a, in a futile attempt to be in front of every single one of your potential eyeballs. Um, but there's a really cost effective way to be in front of 95% of your eyeballs, um, which is enough. Um, and that's, you know, realestate.com.au and, and domain. And, and even within that, realestate.com.au is, is sufficient. Um, you know, you don't have to, to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to, to do that. Um, you know, uh, for $569, um, in some cases, even less, uh, you can have exposure on, on both of these sites. And yes, granted, it'll be only a standard ad, um, but sometimes, actually not sometimes, in most cases, that's enough. Um, we can get into why, you know, you should be very um, careful about letting yourself be convinced uh, to upgrade to a premier ad, um, but that could be for a different, you know, different time. Um, yeah, but essentially, there's, that's not difficult. There's also uh, a lot more modern marketing techniques with Facebook advertising and uh, Google advertising and those sorts of things where you can actually get in front of targeted buyers that are very specifically searching for your criteria. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you can retarget people who, who, um, uh, who have searched for properties in a certain area, um, on realestate.com.au. But the thing is most of your buyers, um, will be looking on realestate.com.au. That is the, you know, we're lucky enough in this country to have, to have a homogeneous marketplace, um, mostly, you know, realestate.com.au where, where everyone knows that that's where you go to buy and sell. And so if there's a buyer, they're likely to be looking on that side. I'm not saying you should discount any other channel, but if, if you're there, um, you're in front of most of your eyeballs. Yeah, and uh, I've, I've been paying some close attention to the number of other property agent listing portals that are actually out there. And there is a little bit of daylight between uh, REA and, and the rest of them at this point in time. Uh, but there's some, there's some up and starters that are, that are you know, going to be nipping at their heels any minute now, um, largely because the cost that they put for their, their uh, advertising is, is so high. Uh, and so I think that there are some market disruptors on the way. Um, yes. I've, uh, I'm quite privy to have had a number of uh, recent chats with, with a number of those uh, up and comers. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quietly looking forward to uh, uh, having a separate Sunday session where we can talk about uh, how and why they're going to be market competitors in the in the near future. So, and I welcome them with open arms. I, I think we're well overdue for some some tough competition for for REA. Um, you know, they're milking their quasi monopoly position for all it's worth. Um, and you know, a lot of people have have tried and failed to topple them. 
Um, so they're still uh, in a very powerful position. I'm secretly hoping that Facebook Marketplace will will be a big hitter. Um, you know, it's free. Um, I, I know it's people aren't going to take it seriously for a while. Um, it, it's a bit, a bit like Gumtree. Um, but I'm secretly hoping that there's going to be some free alternative. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm going to, uh, I'll challenge that one to say, uh, the number of properties that I've seen on free listing portals, uh, it tends to, to reflect the fact that that person is a penny pincher. Um, and uh, not that that in itself, but uh, you can actually use that to your advantage in the negotiation point of view, knowing what their psyche is right up front. Um, and, you know, if they were too afraid to, to put it in front of the most amount of eyeballs, then, you know, maybe they deserve not getting the price point they're after. So exactly. Yeah. Absolutely right. Uh, one P to go, mate. Let's go. Okay. So the last one, parlaying. Um, so this is all the communication that happens between um, a seller and a buyer, not just negotiation. And um, so the idea here is to uh, develop or create rapport with your buyer. So as soon as they walk through the door, um, you know, welcome them in. Um, you're not making friends. You're just a rapport, a positive rapport um, will will develop almost automatically anyway, um, unless you're a really grumpy person. Um, but so the idea is to is to create that rapport and and um, play on that theory of reciprocity, where you know you're um, you're being courteous, um, cordial, friendly, um, helpful, um, and generally that will come back. Uh, so that's you know, how you should think about the relationship. Um, with the negotiation itself, um, the, the way that happens with, um, with my clients is that it happens in writing. So with negotiation, you're not just negotiating the price and the terms. You're negotiating how you negotiate. And um, so I, I try and take that con control and, um, uh, and make sure that negotiation occurs in writing not verbally because you've got more time to, to, to think you've got more time to come up with um, better responses. They're going to be higher quality responses. And, um, um, and so that's why I, yeah, I do it this way. You can wordsmith it rather than trying to make up something on the spot and stumble and, um, and, and the like. So yeah, exactly. I'm, uh, and for those who do it a lot, they can get confident to do it on the fly. But for those who don't, uh, in writing allows you a lot of time to actually do that. And then there's the, uh, the old uh, negotiation tactics. Uh, you know, the, the most common one is good cop, bad cop. Um, and, uh, but there's a number of others out there, but uh, effectively you want one person who has the rapport uh, and another one uh, who is able to break that rapport mm -hmm. while still maintaining the first person with the rapport. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, oh, I just need to speak to the wife. She's the one who knows the budget or yes. you know, those sorts of things, you know, so yes. you can maintain that, that uh, really good relationship. Um, and it's, it's the wife that's the cranky one, not me. So let me go, <laughs> let me see if I can get her, her approval. Yes. Exactly. So, um, you know, going back to your wordsmith thing, um, I mean, I love negotiating verbally, um, but even I prefer written negotiation because as you said you know you can really really think about every single word that goes into that response and those words can do some very heavy lifting so they're worth thinking about um and so the way i help my clients with this is um when they get a an offer which is on a captured on one page document um that starts the process i have a chat with my with my client about you know the, the potential buyer uh, um all the interactions that they've had um, and then I craft the response. Um, and often I craft a response. Sometimes those responses, um, you know, are, are, are pointed. I mean, we want to achieve something, but we do it in a way which um, doesn't harm the relationship. Um, and that can be a very delicate balancing act. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, uh, so uh, I'm going to say at this point, why don't we go to the uh, to the crowd to to uh, Facebook and see what Facebook's got to say and uh, see if they want to uh, uh, challenge you or ask you questions or or the like. So uh, a lot of people on there just saying hi. So hi to everyone. Um, so 
Todd is uh, commenting on the fact that um, he uses building and pest inspections at, at auctions and works well and created a lot of trust. So well, well done, mate. Uh, Ashish says that in Canberra, uh, it's actually added as part of the marketing contract. It's actually um, uh, part of the process mm -hmm. uh, and the buyer pays for that at settlement. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's funded up front um, mm -hmm. and needs to be part of the contract. So I didn't know that about Canberra. So that's good to know, Ashish. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that share, my friend. Um, Luke has said, uh, interesting the way to take people's mind off price is presentation. Um, I, I can talk to uh, my old days, I, I spent 20 odd years in IT, but in IT, that was very, very sales focused. And we tried to do everything we could to take uh, our clients view away from dollar per hour rates. And it was all about what's the value we're providing. Um, you know, value sales and that sort of thing. And this is what you're doing here is exactly the same thing and uh, just taken to a lot more personal level. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the one that uh, came to mind before was uh, I know that our, our role as property developers is solving people's problems. And so some of the things that you've touched on uh, is actually solving the people's problems. So find all the flaws and fix them uh, or, <laughs> You know, find a way to cover it with a couch or something like that. So uh, people people don't realise that the problems that they need to solve along the way. So uh, K Wong is saying hi, David. Uh, when you sell a house with a with a permit to build, so development approval in in other states uh, or uh, building approval, uh, would you still want to focus on marketing since the house is going to be knocked down, uh, or would you spend more money on the marketing material on the future new build? So this is more selling off the plan by the sound of it for a house and land package or townhouse project or something along those lines. So, mm -hmm. you know, so everything that you've touched on so far has been aimed at the emotional uh, buyer on an existing home. So mm -hmm. how would that apply when you're trying to do a brand new home or, or house and land type package? Yeah, well, look, if, if it's a home that's still um, uh, livable, but that's not its highest and best use and therefore won't attract the highest price, then I wouldn't be focusing um, on the person who's likely to buy it for that reason. Um, I'd be focusing on the person who will be looking to, you know, take it on as a project. Um, and, and that's how you should pitch it. And there's various different ways to, um, and that's a very well, I different. Think he, I think he's saying he's the one who's going to build it and, and he's trying to market to his ultimate buyer of the finished product. Um, so using your five P's, uh, I would actually make sure that you're actually putting together marketing material that actually has things like color selections and um, your tiles and your flooring and um, they call it a mood board. And so it's a, a board yeah. that actually has all of the different uh, elements of, of what it is that you're actually going to be building uh, yes. and also get renders of your finished products so people can Absolutely. see what it looks like um, Absolutely. and 3D walkthroughs, things like that. Uh, K Wong. So uh, exactly. you want to, the thing with, with two dimensional floor plans is people can't use their imagination. They can't say, what would my couch look like in there? So you want to show them a picture with a couch in there or give them a 3D tool where they can insert a couch in there and see exactly where it fits and how it fits and that sort of thing. So yeah. it comes back to taking that, um, taking away the problem so the problem is they can't use their imagination and see it um just, and to, just also, to add to that yep. sorry to interrupt rob just to, just to add to that um it's very important to use high quality renders not just any renders because um, a poor render can really detract from the overall impression and if it's the first impression they're going to have it's not going to be a good one um and also um just think about this if you find a buyer for your project before it's completed uh, chances are uh, you may have to take a hit on the price because you know you cannot convey um, perceived value in the same way with a product they can't touch and feel and see as the product that they can which is the built product um, which is going to be costing you a lot more money at that stage you know peak debt etc um, so you have to weigh up the two options of potentially, you know, engaging someone emotionally um, at a higher level with a finished product that they can see, touch, feel, smell versus selling off the plan um, and maybe taking a little bit of hit on the, on the, on the price, but, you know, um, doing it sooner. Yeah. And, and I would I'd add to that to say, 
different reasons for selling off the plan and selling finished. One is risk mitigation. So you might not want to take the risk and build it because you can't afford the holding costs of the tail. Uh, so you may be selling off the plan early, uh, or it might be that your finance has mandated that you're selling early, uh, which is another reason to be selling off the plan uh, up front. But when you do, the incoming buyer is generally going to base their value, uh, their valuation of that property on a third party valuer uh, on the market. And those valuers are going to be quite conservative because they can't actually see the finished product themselves. So, so your, your starting point is already lower. Um, then you've got the, I can't use my imagination um, element. And then on top of that, they've got the, the trust element to say, well, I'm not really sure if that mood board that you've shown me in that render is actually what's going to turn up, right? So uh, they, they will factor a risk element in it. So selling off the plan will typically uh, get a lower sale price. Um, the flip side of that, as you said, is when it's finished, you can put all of those elements in and have that emotional sale and have it um, looking its best and presented its best. You'll get the higher price point, but the flip side is you're also at a higher risk point at this point in time uh, and you're at peak debt because you've funded that all yourself. And unless you get that sale, um, it's going to hurt. So, you know, everyone's going to be in a different position as to should they sell off the plan versus should they sell at the end. Um, exactly. Yeah. And uh, and it, it's really a, a, a really a personal decision, Kay Wong, as to uh, whether or not uh, whether or not you want to limit your risk, but then limit your upside uh, or, you know, or roll the dice and, uh, and, you know, with risk comes reward, uh, but, but make sure that you can afford the pain if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve's got a very similar type question. So his question is, do you have any strategies for selling vacant blocks of land uh, or selling direct to builders? Uh, yes, so again, very different product, um, which requires a different marketing method, and you can get creative with it with these. There are um, there are companies out there who actually specialize in this, and they will actually um, package a house and land um, deal um, with a number of various builders. They're not um, married to any one particular builder. Um, some of them actually do it for free. Others may charge a small fee up, fee up front. Um, but even if you go to someone like Dixon Homes. Um, and ask them to, uh, you know, to put a house and land package deal together. Um, you can actually get a free out of the, a free ad, a free listing out of it. Um, they will advertise it on realestate.com.au for free. Yeah. So rather than naming an individual builder, there's a lot of builders that will actually do exactly yeah. that. You've got to find the right builder for the right product that suits that area. Um, if it's a budget area, you might go for a budget builder. If it's a high-end area, you might go for a high-end builder. Um, but, there, but there are also marketing channels that very specifically aim at, uh, uh, I guess, down the investor path where they're wanting to buy off the plan and be able to get depreciation schedules and things like that. So they will sell into real estate, um, sorry, not into real estate, into accounting firms, into uh, legal fraternities, uh, into... Um, uh, finance brokers, all those sorts of things to say, well, we'll actually give the, the, the broker a little bit of a cut on the way through of the commission, uh, but they've got a number of high net worth people who are actually looking for exactly that kind of stock. So there are those channels to actually push stock down. Uh, it's whether or not the product you've got suits them, that those particular channels. Um, and and uh, as a community, one of the things that we're trying to do is to say, well, you know, individually, if you're only doing three or four houses, um, that might not be attractive to those channels. But if we collected, uh, you know, we've got nearly 9,000 people in our community now. If we collected uh, 9,000 people all doing two or three homes at a time, uh, all of a sudden that's quite an attractive uh, proposition to those portals. So uh, watch this space, um, Kay Wong. There's, uh, there's movement afoot in, in that, my friend. Uh, but uh, yes. Uh, so Jesse's got a question. Uh, outside of realestate.com.au, what would be the single best value add in a sales campaign? Uh, something you, sorry, should, something you should ask your agent or do yourself. Uh, just to clarify, so that I'm, I'm guessing no, I think, another I another channel. Actually, I think that's actually two questions, but um, it's come through as one. So 
Uh, what would be the single best value add other than realestate.com.au? So if you wanted to do two chunks of the, the marketing pie, what, what else would you do? Well, I, I would say domain. Domain is um, uh, is still quite, you know, it's it, it's um, it's got a lot of weight still. Um, so I wouldn't discount domain. Um, and look, I think Facebook is is um, having a lot of traction, but it's got to be done in the right way because uh, Facebook is interruptive marketing, and uh, and people don't buy property um, <laughs> by being interrupted on Facebook. So um, yeah, a lot of people are wooed by agents that they you know market you know on Facebook, but I'd really want to understand how that happens before you know before I'm 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 wooed by it. Um, it's got to be done in a very, very particular way, you know, retargeting people who have searched in a certain, um, a certain area, a certain price point, et cetera, et cetera, that, that is more effective. Um, but social media is, is that is exactly that it's social. It's not about flogging product. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, along those lines, depending upon the market demographic and where your product is actually suited, um, there are a number of channels that, uh, actually push the sales outside of uh, the Australian geographic region. Uh, and so if you think that an overseas purchaser uh, might be uh, an attractive target market for, for what you're doing, so brand new homes, for example, uh, Foreign Investment Review Board rules say they can only buy brand new homes or homes that are house and land packages, uh, you know, that would suit. You might wanna consider some of those other alternative channels uh, as well. Um, I know that, you know, there's ones that concentrate on specifically the US community. There's ones that concentrate specifically on the Chinese community. Uh, there's a lot of sales that happen through uh, the WeChat platform, for example. Uh, but yeah, and I know that uh, with the different uh, listing portals, they actually have people that actually translate that into overseas markets as well. That's right. Uh, and I think one of these portals um i think is due way it's it's geared uh, specifically to, to the chinese market um yep. a lot of those buyers have, have dried up these days so um that's become less less popular um but yeah there, there are some other alternatives well right this very moment the uh, foreign investment review board rules have have uh, changed under COVID to basically say uh rather than having a million dollar threshold for somebody to buy a property uh, now it's a zero dollar threshold, meaning that every single purchaser gets assessed. Uh, and instead of it being a 30 day timeline, it's now a six month timeline for that to assessment to happen. So yes, it has slowed down quite considerably. Um, plus they've put extra uh, excises on those. But that said, um, I guess the, uh, the Aussie dollar has actually still made it attractive for people to, to want to do that. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're getting a better bang for buck. Yeah. Um, now, I think I missed a question from Luke, so I'm going to go back there, but uh, it's very similar. So uh, what do you think about the opportunity of LinkedIn or other such networks? So social media networks, and I think you've answered that already by saying social media is really social media. It's not really aimed at, uh, I guess, that sales side of things. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for a, a good, if you're doing this all day, every day, and you can actually build that social media channel where people are following you for the sale, I think there's probably value to that. Uh, but if you're doing it as a one-off, um, you're probably not going to have the reach or the traction. That would probably be my take on that. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, you can you can always augment, um, you know, your tr traditional um, campaign on, on realestate.com.au with, you know, with Facebook, especially as, as Rob said, if you've got a large enough following. I know agents who, um, who sell a lot of... Um, you know, their listings even before going to realestate.com.au um, simply by doing a Facebook Live, you know, just like this one and um, and walking through the home and and, uh, and talking it up because they do have quite a large following. Um, now, it's not to say that it wouldn't sell on realestate.com.au. It would, and I would dare say that it would have a much larger audience, but, you know, each to, each to their own. Very good. Uh, next question is from uh, Nigel. So firstly, he says, sorry, I missed the start. Um, uh, but uh, free plug for you. So this is David, uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, your private selling clients and your website, uh, et cetera. So your process, so free plug, mate. So revolutionaryrealestate.com.au. Um, uh, how do people engage with you and, and what's the basic process without going into a lot of detail? 
Yeah, look, um, I'm I'm loath I'm loath the free plug, but um, if I'm forced with my arm, you know, twisted behind my back, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a lengthy URL. I didn't give it too much thought. Um, uh, revolutionaryrealestate.com.au. Um, if you haven't fallen asleep already, um, on there if you want, um, you can download this free book. Um, real estate agents don't sell homes. Um, not the least controversial topic or, or title. And and uh, I think that combined with what you see on on the on the website will will give give you a, a good taste. Yeah, very good. Uh, so Todd says I'm interested to know if this method will uh, outperform a top selling agent in an area uh, who gets consistent results, or if you know will work uh, hard to get the sales, particularly if they walk in uh, buyers to their physical office. Uh, I'm going to say Todd, um, the point of this process isn't necessarily that you take on this all by yourself. It's uh, making sure that if you intend to use an agent who's got some uh, some traction, that they're actually following a process like this. Um, and if they're not, the ability to empower you to actually do that um, with the assistance of David, uh, I guess, if if need be. So um, it's really making sure that you know they're just not plugging an ad up and hoping. Yeah. And just just to add to that, top selling agent. That, that's an interesting title, um, and a lot of people unfortunately um, have this as their sole um, selection criteria when when looking for a solution. But an agent, any agent who um, sells a lot of homes, um, it, it, volume is not necessarily the same as as um, uh, you know as, as the outcome, as the best sell you know selling price. Two very different things. And, and I would add to that, I always do a little bit of homework on my agents and have a look at the history of sales that they have done in the area, looking at a couple of different criteria. So uh, if you think of a matrix of, of two different criteria, you've got uh, days on market for their sales to actually occur. Uh, and then you've got the difference in, in sale price to the difference in listing price. If mm -hmm. you think of those two in combination, uh, are they selling close to the original list? In which case yeah. they were very realistic up front and, and got it right. And are they yeah. selling in a very short time period? Um, it tells you something very, very different to do they start high and then start uh, putting a lot of pressure on, on the vendor to, um, uh, and I'm trying to remember what the terminology is, but it's conditioning the vendor, uh, condition the vendor down to a price point that actually sells. Yes. Uh, you, you can actually tell a lot by doing your homework on, on an agent and you can get a lot of that info uh, out of your, your standard portals. So, um, you know, there's uh, RP data, there's price finder, there's uh, a tool that we'll be releasing very soon ourselves. Uh, so watch this space folks. Um, but there's also oldlistings.com, there's uh, pricedata.properties, there's a number of others out there where you can actually look at that stuff, uh, compare that to the average turnover in the in the uh, in the area in the suburb, uh, and you'll get a, a very good insight. So you know if you've got 90 day average turnover, uh, and you're seeing an agent turning it over in 45 days, that's probably a better indicator as to the kind of agent they are, and you know the difference in those listing versus actual sale price. Um, mm -hmm. That little combo creates a little matrix that tells you, uh, you know, are they uh, are they a list and crunch type agent where they list it at high price and, and squeeze you down? Uh, are they a fair market uh, agent type price? Mm -hmm. um, or, or do they uh, list it at a, uh, at a low price and then drive the price up by creating a lot of competition? So that those, mm -hmm. uh, those agents are out there as well. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, do your homework as I'd say, because a, a sale is not a sale. It really, what pressure do they put on the vendor to make that actually happen. Exactly right. The, and the thing I'd add to that as well is you've got to look at these in, in, in combination because looking at days on market in isolation, again, by itself doesn't, doesn't tell you much. Um, uh, you know, it could be, um, uh, you know, a, a terrible outcome that just happened quickly. Um, so uh, another metric, which is much, much harder to find um, is the, the ratio of, of sales to listings. Um, and I think most people would be um, surprised to find or surprised to find out or to know that um, as an average in Australia, um, agents only sell half of what they list. Um, the top 100 agents um, only sell seven out of 10, so 70% of what 
of what they list. Um, not entirely always all, the, all their phone uh, fault, uh, but these are just the statistics. Yeah, and uh, I hadn't really thought about that uh, listing versus sale figure. So that would be a uh, a very interesting one to try try and track. Is there a um, uh, a tool that you've seen out there that that makes that easy to track down? Or unfortunately, not. Uh, there isn't. And this is this is the industry's best kept secret. Um, they don't want anyone to, to know this, and very good reason, obviously. Um, but I also have to put this in, in context of, of the average success rate of a private seller. Um, and again, this is something most people don't realize. 70% um, of private sellers fail. Um, so they've only got a 30% success rate. So an agent is still better. There you go. Uh, if they follow a process. Correct. It's all about the process, not the person. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Uh, so uh jesse's asked a little bit of an off market sorry an off topic question uh with regards to um uh people doing digital renders uh i might try and deal with that offline jesse that's probably a better way to deal with that so that's probably more just for people doing brand spanking new uh we're just trying to keep this on the sales process today um dan's got a question uh what do you think about virtual reality uh, as a tool to increase the level of perceived value uh, and potentially not take a hit when selling off the plan. What's exactly meant by virtual reality? You mean a video tour of the of the property, or a, a yeah? Virtual... So if if I look at virtual reality as an act, and this is me and my nerdy techo hat, um, having spent twenty odd years in IT, um, virtual reality usually means putting on glasses and and seeing it in three D. Um, I would say that's actually a disincentive, Dan, because one, you have to have the technology, two, it's clunky and cumbersome uh, and uh, can be quite challenging. But you can do 3D virtual tours, which are very easy to do uh, and don't need any extra technology. And you can, uh, there are lots of tools out there that allow you to do things like spin the, the property around and look at it at different angles and, and add furniture packs in there. So things like that, absolutely, I would I would 100% categorically do that, whether it's a brand new home or a secondhand home. Uh, you know, when you put a floor plan on your on your ad, don't make it a 2D floor plan. Make it a 3D floor plan. Um, it's an incremental cost uh, in in actually uh, listing the the sale. You know, you, you're talking about 250 bucks versus 350 bucks uh, to actually get that floor plan done, but the the perceived value and the ability for them to spin it around. Uh, I can't remember the exact stats off the top of my head, but I know that the number of people who've got those 3D walkthrough floor plans, the people who stay on their side are usually staying on there nearly twice as long um, and because they're actually playing with the tool and spinning it around. And, and you know, so uh, it gets a lot more in engagement. And I think that sort of tool would be much, much better. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, got a question from Dan. I've completed uh, four houses brand new. Don't want to go. To, uh, don't want to go to the market yet. What are the best ways to go to market with uh, alternative methods? Um, so I'm I'm not quite sure the context there, Dan. Are you wanting to go off the plan or are you wanting to go as finished product? Um, I think we've covered the off the plan side of things well, but. Uh, I guess it's probably more the finished product side of things and everything that you've said, David, I'd say would still apply. So make sure you stage it, make sure you put ambient music, make sure you uh, do all the things that take away all the negatives of the, of the property. Exactly right. Absolutely. And, and I think it was about the finished product. Um, so what the alternatives, I guess, uh, these days, it's not just, you know, real estate agents, it's not just um, the DIY sell it yourself portals. Um, uh, you know, there are other alternatives, um, hybrid alternatives, I guess, um, for lack of a better word. Yep. Uh, Karen's got a question. Uh, how does David have the stats on agent sales? Um, so the, the listings versus sales, mate, where did that come from? Is that an industry advertised um, stat? <laughs> it's, it's not. And you won't find it on Google. Um, I challenge you to Google it. You won't find it. Um, I found this... Um, I read about this um, on one of the agents. Uh, there was um, a competition um, among agents. I'm not quite sure which body um, oversaw this competition. And as part of this competition to find, I think, the top 100 agents, um, 
they, um, you know, th this came out. Uh, this was one of the um, stats that was tracked. The, the assessment um, criteria. That's that's right. Um, actually, it wasn't even one of the assessment criteria. <laughs> it was just one of the um, uh, one of the metrics that was metrics that was tracked as a as a side to it, and and that's how I came across it. But this was in a very obscure little study. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good. Uh, so a bit of a long question here from Declan. Uh, so firstly, you said thanks for sharing the the link to the ebook. So um, you're welcome, mate. Uh, question around selling my own developments, i.e. vacant land from subdivisions. Would you still be involving a sales agent at the early stage to get an idea of what the land would be worth in the DD stage or research stage? So I'm going to say uh, yes to that, but I would also say that you want to be making sure that you also have your own sales research tools. So your RP data, your price finders and the tool I'm about to release um so um yeah so make sure that you've got those tools handy yourself Declan and and that the agents are really just confirming your findings and and giving you a little bit more uh, on the ground insight into that um absolutely I completely agree Rob and I don't think the um you know um research should only be done you know using agents as you said you know it should just augment your your own research um yeah Yep, uh, he's gone on to do like a part two of this question. So uh, if you're an area expert with market knowledge, you can complete the process without engaging an agent at all? Question mark. Well, the answer is to that categorically, yes, you can. Uh, question is whether you want to and uh, whether you know the process to actually follow. And hopefully we've given you some insights into that today. Uh, and if you need some assistance, I'm sure that Dave would uh, happily uh, offer his uh, assistance there. Um, uh, I like the idea of selling yourself uh, and in the process of my full license myself. So I don't want to be wasting the agent's time if you don't intend to sell with them. So depending upon your jurisdiction, Declan, uh, whether or not you actually need a real estate agent's license to sell your own stock, uh, it used to be that you did uh, and many of the states have actually dropped that requirement now. So if it's your own stock, um, in, in most instances, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any jurisdiction that mandates that anymore. I can't speak to that, but yeah, um, I I would second what you what you've just said, Rob. Yeah. Uh, Kay Wong says, uh, "Hi, David. Do you have a Facebook page?" Yes, I do. Um, so, David Katie, property marketing strategist. So, what we'll do, Kay Wong, we'll we'll finish doing the chat, and then we'll we'll paste into the uh, uh, into the feed a little bit later those links just to, to help everybody out. Um, just saves us tapping away on the keyboard here. Uh, and uh, lucky last question. Um, hi, David. Uh, I can see your strategy can be done if the vendor lives in the same state as the property. What about if the vendor is selling an interstate property? That's a that's a good question. Excellent question. And usually, um, my method of marketing is not geared for that. Um, I have spoken with people in the past where um, uh, you know they were living remotely from from the property that they were looking to market or to sell. Uh, and in some cases they had family or friends that still live nearby who they could engage to help with this, um, uh, you know, step of opening the door. Uh, it, it's the easiest step because 99% of your marketing is done before the door is open. Therefore, um, you know, if it's done right, it doesn't matter who opens the door. If it's done poorly, it doesn't matter who opens the door. Yeah. So, uh, what I would say to that, though, is if you don't have someone that can actually look after it um, uh, remotely on your behalf, at least still use the principles uh, in, in trying to assess an agent who can actually do this on your behalf. Um, make sure that they are going to follow the same processes. Make sure that you're uh, doing all those, uh, all the five Ps um, and, you know, that you're more likely to actually have success in that approach. So. Uh, whether you're going to do it yourself, whether you're going to engage an agent, whether you're going to get uh, David involved, uh, it's the process uh, that makes the, the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, this one is more a statement, but, but I think, uh, so Mark has said, uh, why don't you just use Zoom, mate, to sell it remotely? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the problem with using that, Mark, is unless you've got a drone on the other end, you can't do the walkthrough of the property. So... Uh, <laughs> yeah, very challenging. Um, but 
Having said that, mate, we have crossed the hour. So thank you very much for your time. Um, very much appreciate uh, the, I guess the insights into the process uh, and all the questions from our audience. Uh, so from myself, Rob Flux, and from David Katie, uh, thank you very much, folks. And we will see you again next week for our next Sunday session. So bye for now, folks. Thanks, guys.